All right, let's talk about some of the specifics of ceramic and polymer fracture. In particular, we're going to focus on how they differ from your traditional metals, right? So first off, ceramics. Um, ceramics, as we've talked about, basically have no plastic deformation. You can't deform them very much at all. They just fracture. Um, the stress razors or concentrators are typically things like pores and impurities. Pores, because when you make ceramics, you start out with a bunch of independent particles and then you merge them together. And so as they come together, you end up with these regions, inter-particle regions, and you have to completely get rid of those regions. And that can be challenging to do. We'll talk more about that a little bit later when we talk about diffusion. But if you don't get rid of them, then you're left over with a pore inside of your material at those junctions, okay? And those can be stress concentrators. Um, the fracture toughness for ceramics is generally rather low. Uh, less than values of 10 megapascals per root meter is pretty common for ceramics. Um, and to put that in comparison, things like aluminum and steel can be 20 to 80 megapascal root meters. It can be much higher. So um, ceramics are much less tough than metals. No surprise. You've known that because you've worked with them. Something that's interesting about ceramics is that slow crack growth is possible. What do we mean by that? Well, we've got this equation for our fracture toughness where the critical mode 1 fracture toughness K1C is equal to y times sigma equal or times the square root of pi a, right? What can happen is we know that at any time if this right hand side of the equation becomes greater than the left hand, we get fracture. What's interesting is that initially the left hand side of the equation is greater than the right hand side, right? So this is larger than this and therefore we don't get crack cracking. It doesn't fracture. But what can happen is that the crack will grow over time. Well, what happens if A right there is growing and getting larger, then the right-hand side of the equation is getting larger and larger until it eventually is larger than the left-hand side of the equation, and at that point you get fatigue and fracture, right? So we call this static fatigue or delayed fracture. Again, the reason this happens is because there's slow crack growth happening. The crack's getting longer, and eventually it's going to get long enough to satisfy this equation where it's larger than the left-hand side, and therefore we get cracking, right? So um, another thing about cracks is that they're very sensitive to uh, their environment, moisture in particular. Um, why? Why is moisture problematic? It changes the, the nature of the crack tip. It's called uh, stress corrosion. Let's imagine a ceramic that looks like this, right? right? And now it's got a crack right? So at that crack, let's say that water gets in there. So now this is all filled with water. Out here, if there was water, let's say that the ceramic would not be very soluble at all. It's not going to dissolve in the water. But if you're loading this thing, even though out here it's not soluble, you can get a scenario where at the tip of a very high radius of curvature crack, the the ceramic does become soluble. It dissolves. And in doing so, as it dissolves, it extends the crack further, right? And makes it a little bit sharper, and then that extends it further, and you end up with the material dissolving away only right at the very crack tip, right? So that stress corrosion, it leads to a sharpening or a growth of the crack um, until, again, it reaches a satisfying, uh, it satisfies the Griffith crack equation. And this right-hand side of the equation is larger than the left. It's bigger than the fracture toughness, and you get fracture. Right, And the amount of time necessary for that to occur obviously uh, is reduced with increasing stress. So if you increase the stress, this corrosion process happens faster. Okay, And you can see this. Uh, my advisor, when I was doing my PhD, we had to break these quartz tubes regularly to seal samples inside of them. And so you scribe them to put a surface crack on it. The surface crack now is a flaw, so you know that it's going to break along that surface crack. That, that lets you break it in a nice way. But then he would lick his finger and wipe it along the crack and... You know, when I'd be like struggling to break some of these tubes because quartz is pretty tough, um, all of a sudden he would do that and then I could take it and I could pop it right in half pretty easily because just that easily by putting that liquid at the surface of the crack greatly weakened it. So uh, that's an example of that. Um, all these different things that can influence the fracture of ceramics leads to greater variation in their fractures. It's a value that fluctuates much more than it does for, say, a metal, right? Now, something to know about ceramics is that they don't typically exhibit stress concentrators under compression, right? That is only under tension. So in the diagram that we showed you before where we said that some flaw present here, uh, that the stress goes up in the vicinity of it, that is not the case under compression, generally speaking. Uh, therefore, ceramics are going to be much stronger under compression than they are under tension. In fact, they're something like 10 to 15 times stronger in compression than tension. And that's why uh, for the longest time in, you know, in the Stone Age, they would build buildings with 
keystones, right? Because everything's under uh, compression and you didn't rely on tension. It wasn't really until we had steel that we started building big structures that relied on tension in their components as opposed to just compression, uh, which changed the way that we can build buildings. Now, having described some of the uh, nuances of ceramic fracture, let's turn our attention to polymers. How are they a little bit different? Well, generally speaking, the yield strength of polymers is much less than either a metal or ceramic, and you know that. Uh, you know, I can take this thing and I can make it yield and bend way easier than a big metal pot or a ceramic pot, right? They're, they're just generally weaker materials. Um, they come in different categories. There are thermosets and thermoplastics. We will learn more about these in a couple chapters. Thermosets are things like epoxy, and they are brittle. And then thermoplastics are things like, you know, most of the other stuff, like this, this here on my phone. This is a plastic, and it's very flexible. Uh, it's very ductile. Um, so there's both brittle and ductile ceramics. We have, a little bit, we have both, depending on conditions. And then even the ductile ones can be brittle, say, at low temperatures and high strain rate, right? If you take and you cool this thing down, it might become very brittle. If I took this Nalgene bottle, soaked it in liquid nitrogen, and I threw it, it would just shatter. Or if I hit it really fast like with a hammer, it might shatter as opposed to bending or deforming, right? Um, and then they can become ductile at high temperatures or low strain rates, just the opposite. Something interesting about ceramics is that they can have something called crazing occur. Crazing is when you get regions of localized yielding leading to interconnected microvoids or fibrillar bridges between the voids where the chain gets oriented. What is that? We can look at it, right? This crack that's forming, you can see this crack in this material running uh, horizontally through this micrograph here. As they're pulling on it, sort of up and down, you see that there are these little chains lining up. These are the polymer's chains. Remember that polymers are made up of long spaghetti chains all stranded and tangled together. You can get regions of these chains that line up as they run through there, uh, right? If the chain is wound up and then it goes over here, you can imagine that those chains could even resist the deformation, right? The resist the opening of that crack, right? So if they're resisting the opening of the crack, should they increase the toughness or decrease it? Hopefully you wrote that it increases it. This should, if it makes it harder for a crack to initiate or propagate, you've made a tougher material. Since this makes it harder for the for both, for initiation and crack propagation, polymers in some instances can be relatively and surprisingly tough. They can be actually, they can absorb a fair bit of energy as you go about breaking them into two components, even though their yield strength isn't much to speak of.